Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed edition of This is Revolution Podcast. Uh, yesterday, we did the patrons-only Mau Mau Hour with Pascal Robert, where it was more of a memorial to the late Glenn Ford. And uh, I wanted to leave that image up because there hasn't been, in my opinion, enough tributes in mainstream media to a true progressive media titan like Glenn Ford. So shout out to to Glenn Ford. And yes, Jason does do all the music intros and all the music that you hear for the video segment because I'm not going to pay for licensing. All that out of the way. Let me bring in our host. It is a Foreign Policy Thursday. If you are new to this show for Thursday, Pascal and I add our foreign policy friends. It's like intellectual Avengers. Coming all the way live from Miami, Florida. The host of the Mau Mau Hour. Always calling out the 50-year counter-revolution always yelling at the colored bourgeoisie my homie my dog pascal robert peace and greetings to the chat peace and greetings to the audience peace and greetings jason miles thank you for giving me the opportunity yet today to do that memorial for glenn ford in uh what was scheduled to be our mau mau hour and uh i think it went very well it seems like people really uh enjoyed it and and uh i felt uh very good i talked to margaret kimberly after the show and she was also very thankful that we took the time uh, to do that so uh, maybe at some point we'll make it public who knows you know again I, I i really mean that uh i was sad to see that there weren't a lot of uh media outlets picking up the death of of a, a true titan you know he's been around media forever and black agenda report as we talked about on the show broke some pretty big stories that people are still talking about to this day especially we talk about barack obama cory booker we talked about so i'm a little hurt but I'm glad we were able to say something. He is not just a dad. He's a professor. He's not just a professor. He's an author. He's not just an author. He's my friend. Me, Gene Bajma. Greetings, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you, Jason and Pascal. Hello to the chat. And I, too, would like to extend my condolences to Pascal and also all the people at Black uh, Agenda Report for the loss of Glenn Ford. I know how much he was an influence on your lives. And I, I, you know, I did not have the good fortune of knowing him, but he, I, I can, you know, feel his imprint on the work that you guys are doing here. And I, I'm sure he's very pleased with, you know, you continuing his political education legacy. Thank you so much, Gene Bajlan, for the kind words. And He's in a bunker somewhere in, I don't even want to say what country he's in. Because if I tell you what country he's in, I'll let too much. I'll, my phone is making weird noises already just because he's on the show. But we love his analysis because the analysis you're getting from this cat is from the inside. He is Deep State Cuba. Gentlemen, the, um, and likewise, um, I was very sorry to hear about um, Glenn. The I actually, before I even came on the podcast, I read Black Agenda Report occasionally, and it was linked through Naked Capitalism, and that's how I heard about it. And um, I think that I was reading Pascal's columns before I ever imagined that I'd be sharing on the space with him you know you're not the first and, one jason was uh pretty much saying the same thing and it was um like it was uh, an education on a segment of the left that i didn't um i didn't really understand um before i started reading it 
and likewise you know it's uh it's a loss and um i'm very i was very sorry to hear the news thank you so much comrade Cuba. so we have a super chat i got promoted on. to comrade from deep state <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts on Mike Duncan's Revolutions podcast season four, Haiti? It's liberal, but is it real? Have you know, do you know Mike Duncan, Pascal? My, who is Mike? Can someone contextualize Mike Duncan for me? I don't know. Nope. We don't know Mike Duncan. I'm sorry. Pascal yeah, only, knows, that. only knows uh, a handful of Haitian podcasters. And by a handful. You want to share a link to that episode? Yeah. We can, uh, I'll check, give it a listen. So before we bring in our esteemed guest, we made by we I mean me made a video <laughs> made a video to get you guys ready for the topic of the day, which is postmodern conservatism. Before I play this video, if you guys haven't done it, please like and subscribe. Hit the bell. We're almost at five thousand. Doesn't cost you anything. I got that out of the way. Enjoy the video. Good evening. It is an honor to be with you tonight. My name is Charlie Kirk. I run the largest pro-American student organization in the country, Turning Point USA, fighting for the future of our republic. Speaking to you in my personal capacity tonight as a 26-year-old, I see the angst of young people as well as the challenges facing new parents. I am here tonight to tell you, to warn you, that this election is a decision between preserving America as we know it and eliminating everything that we love. Postmodernism is often thought of as an influential ideological trend within more liberally inclined academic circles. Indeed, political forces on the right often attack academia as being beholden to a postmodern ideological trend that reject concepts such as truth and objectivity. However, what is postmodernism? What explains the rise of the postmodern thought? And in what ways in modern conservatism itself is postmodern in its orientation? We'll ask these questions and more. This is Revolution. If I may say so, Mr. Smith, it's extremely interesting uh, uh, and extremely lively to sit by and watch a professional uh, critics of the Republican Party uh, burlesque. Uh, people whom uh, the Republicans themselves tend to like. You, 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 you may have forgotten that a few moments ago we were treated to Mr. Gorvidal, the, the playwright, saying uh, that after all, Ronald Reagan was nothing more than a, quote, a aging Hollywood juvenile actor. Now, to, to begin with, everybody is aging. <laughs> Uh, even uh, even uh, you are, Bill. Bill. You are, right. Bill. Yes. Yeah, so, so therefore, so, so therefore right. that adjective didn't contribute anything uh, extraordinary to the human understanding. Then he said Hollywood. Now, one was either acted in Hollywood during the time Mr. Reagan acted, or one didn't uh, act uh, at all. Uh, Mr. Vidal <laughs> sends all of his books to Hollywood, many of which are, are rejected, but some of which are, are going out in film. Oh, Mr. Bill, I never said any of that. He called him a juvenile actor. Uh, which is presumably to be distinguished from uh, an adult uh, uh, actor. Now, my, my point is, yes, that if, you play, if you play this sort of a game, you can say, look, I don't think it's right to present Mr. Gore Vidal as a political commentator of any consequence, since he is nothing more than, uh, uh, than a literary producer of, uh, uh, of, of a perverted uh, Hollywood-minded prose. For decades, ruling class leaders in both parties sold out our future to China, to faceless corporations, and to self-serving lobbyists. They did it to preserve their own power and enrich themselves, all while rigging the system to hold down the good, decent middle-class patriots striving to build a family and pursue a decent life. All of this changed dramatically in 2015 when a billionaire named Donald Trump put his own life of luxury on the line. Okay, now, we're gonna need a business manager to help us avoid paying taxes. <laughs> taxes. A tax is a terrible, hairy, liberal monster. <laughs> the big teeth. <laughs> the only thing, the only thing 
thing that can stop the terrible tax monster is a Republican. <laughs> wants to be a Republican. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed that clip. I hope you enjoyed the soundtrack. Because to make that clip, much like our guest, I had to sit through so much. William Buckley. Charlie Kirk clip was easy. Candace Owens clip was easy. Sitting through William Buckley clips to try to find the right one that my friend is like masturbating with a cheese grater so let's bring in our <laughs> our guest coming all the way from canada 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 he is mad mcmanus <laughs> Welcome. So I just can't get that image of fucking masturbating to Bill Buckley with a cheese grater out of my mind now. I that's just ruined the night. You want to have a serious conversation about stuff? It's just going downhill from now on. I I so look I, before I, I and I want to ask the first question before I disappear off the screen. I saw that you were reading Ben Shapiro's book. Yeah, finished it today. It may not be masturbating with a cheese grater. It may just be punching your penis head with a sledgehammer. <laughs> I don't know what's worse. What's with all the phallic humor, man? <laughs> because that's what it's like, Pascal. You don't make this shit. You sit uh, back. I asked these guys. I begged these guys. I was like, "Can you guys help me with the script?" I think I think Gene ended up helping me with the with the script last minute, or maybe it was Pat. I can't remember who did it. But anyway, I'm no, true. My wife looked at the book come in and she was like, "What the fuck are you doing with that in my apartment?" Right? <laughs> I was like, "I'm doing it for work." You know, we, we all gotta carry our burdens, just like uh, you know everyone. It's your cross to bear. It, yeah. it. Thank you for your service. So, so, yeah, Gene. Gene actually said that. I was like, "I'm watching so much William Buckley," and uh, and he goes, "Thank you for your service." <laughs> Everybody else just got radio silence. So I mean, I'm looking at you. You had like a Facebook or Twitter post, can't remember, of you reading this Ben Shapiro book. And I was like, well, if McManus can do it, then I can I can bear through it for a two-minute clip. But there's a question being asked in the chat, and I'm sure you get this question all the time. In reading through your book, you explain it, but I want to have you explain it on air. What is postmodernism? Sure. Uh, well, you know, it, it's meant a lot of things to a lot of different people, right? To some people, postmodernism just is Rick and Morty, right? Uh, or Sal Park or any of those kind of cartoons. Uh, for other people, it's an evil cultural Marxist conspiracy theory to try to take over the entire world by apparently getting people to read Jacques Derrida, after which they're all going to vote for the Democratic Party one after another, right? Uh, the way that I kind of interpret it in my book, following on different Marxists like uh, Frederick Jameson uh, or Wendy Brown, for that matter, is as a cultural condition created by late capitalism, postmodern capitalism, however it is that you want to call it, uh, where the logic of the market tends to seep into everyday life. Um, and the kind of thing about market capitalism is everything is exchangeable in the market. Everything is relative uh, to everything else because uh, everything needs to be exchanged with everything else uh, in terms of equivalences, right? Uh, and once we take that kind of approach to things like values uh, and we see them as just flowing from what it is that we want, um, what it is that we're able to pay for what it is that we want. Uh, we get a really weird culture that produces some very, very unusual kinds of politics, right? And postmodern conservatism is what I call the reactionary politics that emerges in this cultural condition. Thank you for that definition, Matt. That was, you know, I, I'm sure that we could have an over one hour conversation alone on varying opinions defining postmodernism. But I'd like you think I'd like to thank you for coming on our show. And I did get a chance to read a great deal of your book and an article Thanks. you wrote uh, as well. Uh, just to give you some context, there's a general theme that we have on this revolution. We call the 50 year counter revolution. And the premise of that theme is that pretty much what American politics and social philosophy has been since the rise of, of Nixon post-68 has been pretty much a counter-revolution against the New Deal Civil Rights Coalition or pretty much the, the new left of the 60s. And that manifested itself in the various rightward-leaning reactionary politics, both economic, social, and otherwise, that came forth 
after that period. So just to familiarize you with that concept and the theme that we have here. What's fascinating to me about your book is how you make the distinction between postmodern conservatism, which is kind of a conservatism that hinges on five basic core principles that you discuss. What is interesting to me is that you seem to kind of suggest that postmodern conservatism is a degeneration downward from the traditional forms of conservatism that we've seen in earlier iterations in the United States. But the main question I wanted to ask you at this particular uh, opportunity is that how would you distinguish postmodern conservatism from some of the reactionary conservatism that we see that comes around in the 60s, ranging from, say, Barry Goldwater to, to, to some of the other straight anti, uh, uh, anti-integration anti type of of uh, of right wing politics that comes forth during that period, uh, you know, uh, was the, the uh, governor of Alabama who ran for president again? His name escapes me at this particular moment, but I think you know who I'm talking about. So, if you can really make the 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 ma- George major George differentiation, George Wallace was a Wallace, yes, differentiation is postmodern conservatism a progression from traditional conservative ideology, or is it an actual break from something that we've normally seen overall in American society, but particularly in the 50-year counter-revolution? Sure. I mean, it's a great question, right? Uh, And I want to say, I wouldn't talk about a progression or even a regression, because I don't think you should be a conservative in the 1950s, and you definitely shouldn't be one now, right? Uh, But there is this shift that's happened uh, in the kind of way that you described. Uh, So one of the things that we on the left don't really understand all that well about conservatism uh, is that it looks a little bit different depending on the country that you're talking about uh, or the context you're talking about. Because conservatism, first and foremost, is a defense of power uh, and social hierarchy and the affiliated inequalities. Uh, So in France, conservatism can look like one thing, a defense of the aristocracy, the Catholic Church and its privileges. In Germany, it can look like something very different. You know, Germany had a very interesting conservative movement uh, where they actually created one of the world's first welfare states, for example, while advancing all kinds of imperialist and racist policies, right? Uh, and in the United States, conservatism usually has consisted of a combination uh, of white nationalism and white racism uh, with support for a kind of capitalist market, right? Uh, and these two things have sometimes coexisted uncomfortably with one another. Uh, what kind of defined conservatism in the 1950s through the 1960s, like you said, was this really militant reaction uh, against the civil rights movement led by people like Bill Buckley, uh, who, you know, had all kinds of racist things to say about MLK. He changed his tune later on when it became unacceptable. Uh, But he founded the National Review to kind of push against the New Deal, push against the civil rights movement. uh, And the philosophy that he came up with is usually characterized uh, as fusionism. Right, which is this combination of support for capitalist markets uh, with a kind of right-wing Christianity, social conservatism, kind of propping that up as a bit of moral support. Right, uh, and in the book, what I argue is that we've seen a transition away from the kind of arguments and positions taken by fusionists, which were usually very, you know, universalistic kind of arguments about the truth of Christianity, the enduring truth of socially conservative morals, uh, the natural laws of the market, uh, towards a much more relativistic fluid, historical form of argumentation. Uh, And no one embodies this better than Trump and the kind of Trump administration, right? Which made it very clear often enough that uh, it perceives its opponents as having one vision of the world uh, and it had a different, much more bullshitty version of the world, you know, sent around all clear into facts, whatever it is that the leader said at any given moment. Uh, And it was much more hyper real in its approach to politics. So we can discuss that a little bit, but that's the kind of transition I try to track out. And I don't think it's a progression or a regression. I think a lot of things have stayed the same and conservatism is still doing what it always does, defending power however it can. Uh, It's just the kind of way it does that, which has shifted. Do you think that the one of the distinctions one can make with postmodern conservatism is that it's defined more so by who they oppose more so than what they stand for? I don't know about that. And one of the reasons is that conservatives have always been reactionary first and foremost, right? And this is kind of what I was getting at when I said that conservatism looks in different in different countries because the progressive movements that they are fighting look different, right? Uh, early on in the French, uh, you know, French context, Uh, conservatism emerged to try to defend the aristocracy against the Jacobins and other kinds of French revolutionaries, right? Uh, In an American context, 
and emerged to try to fight against the push for racial equality and later women's equality, sexual equality, you know, you name it, uh, and to try to defend capitalism uh, against various movements that tried to create a more equal society that worked for everyone rather than just for the rich, right? Uh, and so the kind of conservatism that's appeared in the US is always stamped by these concerns, right? Uh, and one of the things that's interesting to me about U.S. conservatism, and you really saw this was Trump, uh, is many of the other countries where there are big conservative movements didn't have powerful liberal uh, kind of ideologies in place until very recently. Uh, the U.S. has always at least officially been a kind of liberal country. Uh, and so the conservatism that you see emerging here always has a kind of liberal quality to this. Uh, and you really see this, uh, I think, for instance, with COVID recently, uh, where Trump tried to defend these really brutally unscientific uh, and harsh policies uh, about that you knew we're going to end up killing thousands of people uh, on the basis that we can't restrict people's liberty uh, to do what it is they want, particularly rich white people's liberty, uh, you know, to not wear a mask, um, because that's just too much of an infringement uh, on our most sacred values, right? Uh, other kind of conservatives in different countries um, haven't taken that kind of stance. Think of somebody like Angela Merkel in Germany, who had a very different kind of perspective. Uh, so, um, you've you situate this um, postmodern conservatism as a uh, something that's developed relatively recently, and it's in some ways a kind of um, analysis similar to the accusations that people like Jordan Peterson make against the left, calling it postmodern uh, neo-Marxism. That's his words, not mine, and we can go into that, but. The um, to what extent is this just a postmodern moment where politics, both on the left and on the right, have taken on some of the characteristics of postmodernism? Things like uh, skepticism for truth and argument, a preoccupation with power, especially cultural power, and it feels as though older forms of liberalism or classical Marxism, for that matter, are deeply rational. They want to win the argument. They believe that in scientific truth and that if you enter, engage in debate with them, they can convince you because their you know, facts and logic are better. But uh, now, much of what passes as political debate no longer has any of that analytic quality. People feel free to um, present you know, alternative facts or um, challenge the very notion that you could reach some kind of objective understanding on any given issue. And instead, the reference is some kind of sacred identitarian um, notion. On the right, it's sacredness rooted in tradition and some kind of Americanness, and some fusion of Christianity and patriotism and whiteness. And on the left, um, in some segments of the left, or what gets described as the left, it's the sacredness of the suffering of marginalized groups. That, um, and if you fully respect that, you don't have to abide by the rules of argumentation, and that creates legitimacy beyond any notion of like truth or, or being factually correct. Uh, so, how much of this just comes from being in a postmodern moment? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's a big, big, long question also, so I'll try to take it in stages, right? Um, first off, I want to say, um, I think we need to distinguish here between, again, postmodern theory uh, and the condition or the culture of postmodernism, however it is you want to call it. Postmodern theory uh, really emerged initially in France. It was a very academic movement. Uh, and like you said, it was a kind of skepticism uh, towards what's sometimes called meta-narratives uh, or grand narratives, depending on the parlance. Uh, and there were a lot of good arguments that postmodern theorists, people like Foucault or Derrida or Lyotard made, uh, trying to challenge, uh, you know, the suppositions of enlightenment or Marxist reason. Uh, and usually the kind of political basis for this was that the kind of universalistic core uh, to enlightenment reason could very quickly be co-opted for imperial or tyrannical projects. And the usual thing that's pointed to, for instance, by post-colonial postmodern theorists, people like Gayatri Spivak is, you know, 
Enlightenment theorists would put forward this idea that Europeans and white people were just more rational than the rest of the world. Uh, they had a better sense for how things work, which justified them going in and colonizing the hell out of the rest of the world. Uh, that was obviously very wrong. And postmodern theory made an important contribution to kind of challenging uh, these cheesy imperial forms of universalism, right? Uh, what we call the postmodern condition or postmodern culture uh, is a little bit different. It's related, and we can get into the, some of those fine-tuned stuff. Um, but really, again, it's a kind of moment uh, where a lot of the sources of our identity, uh, our shared identity and our individual identity come under question. Uh, and I think that it has produced different kinds of politics on the left and on the right. Uh, and I should say, I'm in favor of a lot of the kind of left-wing postmodern politics uh, that come out there. I have criticisms of them. Uh, I tend to agree with uh, Dr. Cornell West, for example, that sometimes they can go too far uh, in the direction of not being attentive to what other Kind of cultural or spiritual traditions might have to offer. Uh, I also agree with Wendy Brown that sometimes we can gain too much of a wounded attachment uh, on a past uh, that's kind of deformed and mutilated by oppressive power uh, and spend too much time focusing on that rather than fixating on the future. But generally, left-wing postmodern politics has been focused on disrupting universalistic narratives uh, and system of power that profess to be neutral and universal in order to make space for kinds of inclusion uh, and the inclusion of marginalized peoples. Uh, and in many ways, this was a historic accomplishment. And I don't think that anybody should be critical of it, right? Uh, demands for inclusion on the part of people of color, women, uh, LGBTQ individuals, all that's something any leftist uh, or any revolutionary should support, right? Uh, on the political right though, uh, and this is what I'm getting at in my book, the kind of postmodern politics that emerges is extremely different, right? Uh, it also responded to the sense that there was destabilization of identity, uh, both social and individual, uh, and created a form of politics around that, uh, but it was much more nostalgic, reactionary kind of politics. Uh, the kind of attitude taken by postmodern conservatives was once upon a time, there was a stable world order uh, centered around a system of power that placed up, us up on the top. Uh, with the corrosion of that system of power, we now don't know long, don't know who we are any longer. And worse than that, we're losing the kind of privileges that we used to have that gave us a sense of stability uh, to our selfhood uh, and to our sense of dignity, right? Uh, and so, what we need to do is turn to a strong man. You know, whether we're talking about Donald Trump or Boris Johnson or Viktor Orban, uh, who's going to put the people back in their place uh, and reassert our authority if you want to speak like Cartman for a few minutes. Uh, so very different kinds of attitudes uh, and politics that emerge on the left and the right in the postmodern condition. Uh, to follow up on something you said about Orban putting the people in their place, and there's a um, there's a there's been a real effort on the left, and I'm thinking of Thomas Frank's book on populism, you know, the, the people know, to uh, rehabilitate populism um, and also just in, in a democratic society, you have um, uh, you place a great deal of importance on public opinion, on consent of uh, the governed, that kind of thing. But what happens when postmodern conservatism can effectively capture a majority of the population, right? If um, Viktor Orban, uh, no postmodern conservative um, says that they're going to put the people in their place. They say that they're speaking for the people. It's always silent majority um, type talk. So what what it actually is the, um, the field in terms of public opinion? Like, do you think that uh, postmodern conservatism, at least in the American concept, has the potential to be majoritarian? No, I don't think so, um, but that's for very specific reasons. Uh, but here, I'll, I'll just go back to talking a little bit about conservatism in general, because I think that really helps to answer your question, right? Uh, it's worth noting that conservatism began as a fundamentally anti-democratic movement. Uh, and this is true in the United States, if you think about Madisonian republicanism and this need to check, put checks uh, on the ability of the majority to govern. Um, it's true in a French context where there was this real aristocratic backlash against the French Revolution. It's true uh, in an English context, right? If you think about somebody like Edmund Burke, the founder of modern English conservatism, uh, his response to the French Revolution was to start to talk about the so-called swinish multitude of people, uh, you know, not ill-read, didn't know anything, thought that they should be in charge of their country. Right? Like the founding fathers talking about the mob. 
Yeah, exactly the same way, right? Uh, and this anti-democratic attitude persisted in conservative circles for a long time, except that people tend to like democracy, right? And as these democratic movements became more powerful, uh, both in Europe and in the United States and elsewhere, there was a kind of acknowledgement on the part of conservative intellectuals first and then conservative politicians later that you had to do something to kind of harness that energy. Right? You couldn't just ignore the swinish multitude any longer, because uh, if you did, then they were eventually going to start electing socialists um, and demanding more reforms, and we can't have that. Right? Uh, so there are all kinds of ways that conservative politicians and intellectuals start to try to draw the populace uh, to their side. And there are a variety of different ways that you can do it. Um, but what we call right-wing populism today uh, is very different than what we might call left-wing populism, uh, somebody like Bernie Sanders, right, in AOC, right? Uh, left-wing populism, again, tends to be about demands for inclusion by groups and people uh, that have been excluded from the, from the get-go, right? Uh, whether you're talking about the working class, whether or not you talk about people of color, whether you talk about women, you know, the list goes on, right? There's kind of this attitude that we need our time. Right? And that's what we should support. Uh, Right-wing populism takes a very different kind of tack. And this is what postmodern conservatism is all about, where it speaks to a group of people and says, once upon a time, you were in charge, right? You had a dignity and a kind of respect in society that has been taken away from you. And we will give it back to you by putting the people who've taken that from you back in their place, right? Uh, and you saw this with somebody like Victor Orban, right? Uh, he ran against the Socialist Party, um, started talking about how it is that there were all these kinds of entitlements that were being created that weren't in the interests of the common people. Uh, when he got into power, he started attacking the idea that the EU was cared more about Islam and Muslim immigrants and refugees uh, than the Hungarian people. And it was his job to kind of protect them uh, from these hordes of individuals that are coming uh, and taking the places. Um, in universities, in the public service, um, in the welfare roles uh, that properly belong to the Hungarian people, right? And the same kind of disposition is something that you find with Donald Trump, right? Uh, where what is the first thing he does when he announces his campaign? Uh, he starts talking about Mexicans, right? And how Mexico is sending it's no good people uh, up north, and they're taking the kind of advantages and jobs and opportunities that rightfully belong uh, to his base, which is white Americans. Right. Uh, so the kind of populism that he adopts really, really different than a kind of left wing populism. And I'd also say it's fundamentally undemocratic uh, if by democracy you mean that everyone should have a say uh, in the kind of politics that governs them and that political institutions should show equal respect to their citizens. So one of the things you mentioned in one of your articles then is when discussing postmodern conservatism, you don't see it as uh, qualitatively different from all earlier manifestations of conservatism. And what I'm, uh, you know, what I'm understanding here, and sort of also influenced by the work of someone like Zimblatt, that for conservatives to operate in uh, a representative democracy, they must have some kind of axis with, in which to at least gain enough electoral power uh, to gain power, and that kind of access is almost invariably along identitarian lines, whether that's anti-Catholicism, whether that's uh, white racial pro politics or some other form of sectarianism. Uh, that seems, you know, very uh, uh, sort of a, a kind of common feature that we might identify in, let's say, more traditional forms of conservatism within representative democracies and more modern postmodern forms. So what I'd like you to really uh, sort of uh, like focus in on perhaps is you mentioned this postmodern conservatism as a kind of radicalization of tendencies that had already existed within uh, the community, which almost brings us to a kind of cultural relativism, which seems at odds with the sort of traditional conservative uh, appeals to sort of uh, time and memorial values or objective morality uh, and things like that to now an almost complete protean cultural relativism, which makes it almost impossible for liberalism to effectively combat it. Because if we're not debating about any principle, what are we actually debating about? Politics becomes entirely spectac spectacle as a, you know, over who can get the sickest burn 
on someone else in a debate, right? Rather than any substantial. Uh, yeah. uh, but Ben Shapiro picking on all those undergraduate students, right? Yeah. Exactly, that kind of thing. So can you talk a little bit about what you mean by the radicalization? Uh, is it, it, it seems to be a qu quantitative difference and a difference of emphasis rather, and a, a difference in rhetorical strategy rather than a substantial transformation. Am I understanding this correctly? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I try to stress uh, in both my books on this is that postmodern conservatism didn't emerge in a vacuum. Uh, you know, postmodernity wasn't created by conservatives. Uh, and it's also important to note that there were deep elements to conservatism uh, that were very happy to assume postmodern forms when the time was right. Uh, and I think this can be a little bit difficult in some senses um, to grasp in an American context because American conservatism is usually espoused this very universalistic kind of conservatism. If you think back to Ronald Reagan and all that bullshit about being a shining city on the hill or the indispensable country, right? That the rest of the world was just supposed to hop, follow. Uh, and if you didn't want to, then it doesn't matter, we'll send in the troops, right? Um, or we'll have a coup and we'll overthrow your government and we'll place it with who we want anyway, right? Uh, but there were a lot of kinds of conservatism, including some strands of conservatism in the United States uh, that were deeply hostile to universalism from the get-go because they associated it with, again, this kind of, enlightenment progressivism, right? With this belief that we're smart enough and the people can be smart enough uh, to understand the world and therefore to remake it the way that they want, right? Uh, and that was something they cannot allow. Uh, and when conservatives get concerned uh, that there's too much confidence on the part of the masses in particular uh, to remake the world, then they start making skeptical kinds of arguments saying things like, the world is too complicated, it's too big, uh, you don't really understand how things are going to operate. And because you don't understand how things are going to operate, uh, if you try to interfere with them, uh, you're just going to break what's already working reasonably well. Thomas Sowell used to make these arguments all the time, by the way, when it came to uh, welfare programs, right? Um, and what I talk about is you know, how it is that uh, these kinds of strands of conservatism in American life and elsewhere uh, mutated in a postmodern context from being pretty intellectual arguments that were more or less, you know, sidelined uh, to academic journals, you know, books by fancy people, uh, and became much more prominent uh, in the public life, right? Where you would see Trumpists all the time saying things like, you know, we should be skeptical of the science, we should be skeptical uh, of what the experts are saying, uh, the people should make up their own mind, but they should trust their leaders, and they should trust what's worked before, right? Uh, all these kinds of skeptical relativistic arguments uh, main to try to counteract uh, the idea that people are intelligent enough to remake society as they see fit. Uh, and if they don't think that the contemporary American society is working for them, then it can be changed. Right? Uh, Matt, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is that when you when you talk about the five bases, the five points that kind of make up postmodern conserv conservative, I think your second point is you're talking about a, a, a heralding back or a veneration of a particular type of identity that has seen has been seen to be assailed or brought down in the current moment that needs to be brought back. And in the book, you say that usually that identity sometimes revolves around whiteness or maleness or both. And uh, in in your presentation on the show, you just said that one of the ways in which conservatism gets its starts in the post World War II era is a kind of reaction against the civil rights movement and the threat against socialists, which are demanding more from capitalism. Is it safe to say that the postmodern conservatism that we see, to, we see today is still a continuation of this kind of revanchist white male identity politics? In that, you know, this, you know, one of the one of the things that we've been talking about having a show about here is that this kind of crisis of masculinity discourse that is pervasive on the uh, on the internet and social media with uh you know the, the manosphere men's rights groups translating into jordan peterson, you know, you know, jordan big, peterson. Big and by the way this phenomenon if you're not aware is cross-racial there are personalities even on black online spaces who really uh repeat these kind of would you call it samuel's one pascal uh i think it's a perfect example who will repeat these kind of revanchist masculinist kind of talking points about how you know the masculinity generally is a proxy for white masculinity is in danger and so on and so forth do you think that one of the basis core elements of postmodern conservatism or is it conservatism overall is uh 
proje projecting a paranoia of the loss of effective control by white men. Do you think that's an, that's a, it's an endemic part of the project? Yes, I do, uh, but with some qualifications uh, in the sense that you gave, which is that it can be post-racial in some, or sorry, um, cross-racial in some circumstances, right? If you think about somebody like Thomas Sowell or Candace Owens, right? Uh, generally speaking, Trumpism definitely had a very powerful white nationalist element to it. Uh, it was sometimes coded and dog whistled, right? But very, very thinly, right? Uh, and usually there was all kinds of bullshit uh, or PC language that was used to hide it, right? Uh, people would talk about culture or they would talk about national identity or they would talk about ethnicity or Christian civilization. You know, there was all those cheesy mm -hmm. pictures of Charlemagne and Charles Martel, you know, that went around for a while, right? Uh, this idea being that our group and our identity and our white identity and our white Christian identity is under threat. Uh, and so what we need is somebody that's going to preserve that, right? Uh, but one of the things that I point out in the book is the kind of identity that's appealing to a postmodern conservative. Uh, it's always nostalgic, right? It's always looking back at some glorious time when that identity was in a position of authority and esteem, right? Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be one thing or another. It depends a lot on the individual and the context they find themselves in, right? Uh, Poles tend to look back uh, to a glorious period of Catholic Polish nationalism, right? Hungarians tend to look back uh, at their alleged history as the kind of forefront against the tides of Islam and the Ottoman Empire coming in. Right. Uh, Trumpists tend to think back to a white nationalist past uh, where everyone knew their place. Right. Uh, but you can also see, again, people like Thomas Sowell in his recent book uh, bemoaning the fact that manliness and masculinity aren't really given uh, the due that they're owed any longer. Right. We become a soft culture uh, where people feel entitled to things. Uh, and that's not what we should have any longer. Right. Uh, so there's always this nostalgic dimension to conservatism are almost always this nostalgic dimension to conservatism. There are a few exceptions, I should say. Um, and particularly in the United States right now, it definitely has a white nationalist connotation, but it doesn't have to, right? It can take different forms depending on the context. So the combination of white nationalism and, and masculinist revanchism is a, is a kind of a necessary element, you would, you would argue, generally. Yeah, I would certainly say so, particularly uh, with something like Donald Trump, right? Because the two kinds of major prongs uh, to his appeal uh, were definitely this, was definitely this kind of white nationalist uh, revanchism, as you put it. Uh, but there was also this sense that particularly feminist uh, and sexual issues were kind of at the cutting edge of the political left in the United States uh, at that moment, right? Uh, if you think about somebody like... Um, you know, the emergence of the trans movement uh, as a very powerful force in American politics. Hillary Clinton running for office uh, as the first real legit uh, kind of woman who had a chance of being president. Uh, and definitely there was a kind of appeal to many postmodern conservatives uh, of this idea that a white man was going to put women and sexual minorities uh, back in their place, right? Uh, and kind of disrupt the acceleration uh, of the transition of our society uh, towards not necessarily an anti-masculine, uh, but not as much of a patriarchal um, kind of society. So uh, how you mentioned Hillary Clinton's uh, run, and also we're beginning to see polling. Pascal shared with me today some polls about Kamala Harris's uh, very unfavorable polling and a potential matchup with Donald Trump. Could you talk a little bit more about how uh, postmodern conservatism specifically relates to sort of postmodern liberalism and postmodern leftism to a certain degree how uh, and why is it more does it seem more politically potent than its liberal and left counterparts sure absolutely and i do think it has been more potent uh, at least for many people uh, than its left wing counterparts uh, because postmodern conservatism does offer a kind of constructive vision of the future uh, that's always nostalgized and can never actually be realized, um, but people can get a sense of what it would look like in their minds, right? Uh, it's a return to an earlier time period uh, that they invariably fetishize uh, in the collective memory, right? Uh, whereas postmodern leftist movements, I think, again, have done a tremendous amount to demand the inclusion uh, of historically marginalized groups in U.S. democracy and elsewhere, right? Uh, but I think the limitations of postmodern politics, and again, people like Wendy Brown and Cornell West have talked about this, uh, are that it's very hard to put forward a shared vision of what our society is going to look like, where you can build a coalition that could demand structural change uh, on a kind of grand scale, both at the domestic and the international level, 
right? Uh, and there are a lot of good reasons to be wary of people who push forward utopian visions for the future. Um, but I do think that somebody like Bernie Sanders or AOC, again, uh, have done a good job of kind of giving us a glimpse of what that would look like in the future. Uh, and what I worry is that if we don't eventually come together and put forward a constructive alternative uh, to the status quo, uh, then people are going to continuously be attracted uh, to the alternative to neoliberalism offered by postmodern conservatism, even if it's a very ugly uh, kind of alternative, right? Uh, and you see this all the time with a lot of Trumpists, right? Uh, who, particularly young Trumpists, uh, who their attitude is, I want to smash the system one way or another, right? Uh, yeah. If I can't smash the system on the left because the left isn't telling me what we should do, uh, then I'll turn to the far right and they'll smash the system for me. Hey, speaking of smashing the system and what you're saying, so right before the show started, my dad called me. And I love my dad. He's a great dude. And he calls me because he wants to like bitch about uh, these these hearings that are going on about January 6th. Where does January 6th and what happened there at the Capitol fit into this context of postmodern conservatism? And this is a question not just to Matt, who thank you for uh, you know answering all these questions. You're you're being just bombarded with long paragraph ass questions. Um, by the paragraph question crew. So I'm, a, I'm asking this question to the panel totally because I respect all of your opinions and I love some of you like play cousins. What effect does this postmodern conservatism rise of figures like Trump and Jordan Peterson for that matter? How do they play into the events of January 6th? Uh, uh, Pascal, or you know what, Cuba, I'll, I'll let you go first, and then Matt, then Jean, then Pascal. Always close with the with the. Well, I think that the that the obvious contradiction of invoking the Constitution, invoking the principles of American government, in an attempt to bully and overwhelm the the government, uh, that very government without going through any of the channels that are listed in the constitution, without um, looking for redress at the local level, without respecting the judiciary. Um, that is, that derives from the, the skepticism of authority and the equalization of the validity of everyone's opinion that I associate with postmodernism. Also the emphasis on play acting posting everything, trying to, uh, if you think about it, you have a crowd of people who are in Congress, who are actually, you've stormed the building, you've actually taken control. Um, and they're there to change the president, to put Donald Trump where they believe he rightfully belongs. They don't start shooting anybody. They don't take hostages. They don't make demands. What do they do? They post. And the belief that in meme magic, in um, politics being downstream from culture, of being able to move events just by um, you know, having enough followers or going sufficiently viral. That emphasis on the spectacle as opposed to somebody actually substantively planning, like who do we need to replace? Which offices do we need to break into? Where, where are the good secrets located? Uh, that too strikes me as um, as coincident with uh, some of the skepticism and um, superficiality that comes out of postmodernism. For, for me, I know because it's just, uh, Jason asked this going around. I think one of the things that I, I I learned from January 6th is that all of this kind of uh, uh, appreciation for tradition, the state, the government, patriotism, the nation, the flag, everything we've been, in reality, when it comes to these reactionaries is actually bogus. And what it is is that they will do anything to maintain power and maintain their control. And that all of that kind of posturing about the important symbols of what we've ever been, the flag in America and patriotism and respect our institutions is a load of garbage. And that if they will throw that all out of the way just to maintain raw power. You know, the fact that, you know, we have a current a current moment in which 
these same charlatans will talk about the importance of freedom of speech, yet we'll have states throughout the country talking about we need to ban talking about American racial history out of some charade of critical race theory because it's, you know, it's it's teaching white kids to be guilty about being white. I mean, this this illustrates the the uh, the the inter the intellectual dishonesty and bankruptcy of their position, and that in reality, the ultimate the ultimate uh, play here is about maintaining power, maintaining hegemony by any means necessary, and and uh, taking it and doing what needs to be done to preserving control of institutions in that society to reify them in the way that reflect the uh, uh you know the either identities or ideologies of those that have traditionally been in power yeah i would i would totally second everything that pascal and uh, uh kuba said i think you know to kind of reiterate the the consu you know january the 6th was the complete liquidation of any sort of notion that real existing precedent and tradition matter to these people and sort of removing that veneer that is often appealed to by conservatives in their practice of government, uh, sort of getting rid of that entire veneer and uh, just making this a question of raw power. But as Kuba said, uh, the postmodern moment has to a certain degree confused even the postmodern conservatives on how uh, power is actually exercise. Certainly, there are many people higher up in existing political power structures who are able to use that power. But for the conservative sort of base, as it were, uh, there's an almost kind of disorientation in how power is exercised. But I would note one other point is that we see an almost tribal reification of political divisions. And what I and I when I use the term tribal, I mean tribal in the sociological sense, in that you know, in a tribal society in Arabia or in Kurdistan and places like that, the tribe is as a body responsible for the for the you know for everything. Uh, so you know, you can attack one member of the tribe, and they can attack somebody who is completely not involved in it. Uh, uh, as uh, you know, uh, as a response, and it would be you know how politics is conducted. And I noticed this in the discourse of conservatives. I was talking to a conservative uh, fr friend of mine the other day, who was uh, who I was saying, well, you know, the Ben and Jerry boycotting Ben and Jerry's in response to their boycott uh, doesn't seem like the good kind of politics. I don't think that's a good thing to be do for for state governments to be involved in that. And their response was, well, California. Uh, your side, using the term your side, your side ca and California boycotted air flights to North Carolina over the trans issue. So we've, we're, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is this, this becomes completely, uh, you know, a, a kind of tribal understanding of how politics is conducted, which leads to political debates, which are no longer about principle, but about whataboutism, about your side did this, my side did this, and about pure unadulterated a grievance. Oh, I want to interject really quick since we have five minutes. Uh, and I really need to ask you this question because we haven't brought it up. Do you, uh, do you reject the framing of the current reactionary right-wing phenomenon globally as a fascist moment or a proto-fascist, crypto-fascist in any way. I noticed that, you know, you kind of uh, avoid that kind of framing. There's some on the left and some liberals who are dedicated to using that terminology to describe this, this political iteration. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Do you find that uh, uh, useless uh, as, as a framing? Do you find it uh, obfuscating as a framing? Uh, please elaborate if you can. I just want to say I thought great comments from everybody, and I agree with a lot of what was said. So uh, I'll try not to be too repetitive because you said what I was planning to better than I could. Uh, on the fascist question, you're absolutely right that I've avoided it, not because I think it's not an important question, uh, but just because I think that sometimes the left can lean too heavily uh, into using the F word uh, as a substitute for really interrogating materially uh, what's going on with these kind of reactionary phenomena, right? And I can absolutely understand why, right? Uh, Trump is a racist, uh, he's an authoritarian, uh, he displays a lot of the kind of theatrical qualities you would associate with a Mussolini or a Hitler, right? Uh, I just didn't want to kind of 
give in to the temptation of reading into the present too much of the past, because I think that we always have a duty to try to interrogate our moment uh, as it is, uh, and to kind of bear the responsibility of trying to change things for the better, right? Um, saying that, after January 6th, I have read some stuff um, that has convinced me by people like Bill Paxton, for example. Um, I might have been wrong about that, right? That maybe you could appropriately call some of these movements fascistic or neo-fascistic, right? Uh, so maybe there's a kind of postmodern fascism um, that's emerging right now. I have to give it a little bit of thought because uh, I'm still not 100% convinced on that, but I've tipped more that way uh, since I started writing this book in 2018. Let's just put it that way. Right? That's fascinating. So you, you, you're, you're moving towards uh, incorporating a fasc uh, the, the, the fascist concept in describing these phenomena. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't want to say that I'm there yet. And I do also want to point out that it's important to say that if it is fascism, it's kind of a neo-fascism, definitely marked by the postmodern era, right? Uh, so we can't just sit there and say, oh, same old, same old, because again, that's letting us uh, off the hook too easy, right? Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm tempted by it. And down the line, I'm sure I'll write something about this, right? Uh, on the question of January 6th, uh, actually, what I want to say... Um, that's a little bit different than what you guys are getting at. And again, you covered a lot of the points I was going to hit on, uh, is that the kind of thing that defined postmodern Trumpism through a lot of its early run uh, was, as many pointed out, a real hyper-real kind of politics, right? A fixation on the immaterial uh, as opposed to the material uh, as a kind of way of investing people's energies in conflicts that wouldn't actually require any substantial change uh, in structures of power and domination, particularly economic structures, right? Uh, I think that what you saw with COVID, though, uh, was a real re-emphasis on the materiality of our lives because the fact of the fucking matter is that nobody wants to die, right? And when you're faced uh, with the prospect that you or a family member are going to lose your job and you might die, it uh, kind of takes you away from this hyper-real politics and reinvests you in the materiality of your life in the world, right? Uh, and I think that what we saw with a lot of the reactions to Trump uh, was a realization that a lot of the kind of styles of politics that he pioneered could not answer uh, this kind of yearning for a real material politics that addresses our very human needs, which is probably why he lost in the long run, right? Uh, and I think what you saw with January 6th uh, was an exposure, as a couple of you put it, uh, that when it can invest itself in these kinds of hyper-real politics and distract using them, then ultimately reactionaries are really happy to just try to use power and force to get what it is that they want, right? Uh, thank God they were stopped. Uh, I don't think that's really because of American institutions. Uh, I think it's probably because of the goodwill of a lot of people uh, on the political left uh, and some liberals, right, who really militated against it uh, from the get-go. Um, but, you know, we had a really close straw, and I don't want to say that we're out of the woods yet because I'm really worried that something worse than Trumpism might come if we're not careful. And on that note, that sounds like we're going to dive down a rabbit hole of even more interesting conversation. Matt, are you down to join us on the patron bonus half for a little bit? Um, I can't because I promised a buddy of mine that we'd go for a walk tonight. Oh. But, oh. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, but if you want, I'd be happy to come by uh, any other time. I had a great time talking to you guys, and, you know, anytime I'm around. Well, uh, I think I got more than enough people to keep a conversation going. Cuba, Pascal, Gene, we all uh, going to do our thing in a little bit? I mean, it's, not like, ever, not, me. it's not like we ever it's talk. It's not like we before. have anything else to do. <laughs> <laughs> Raise a family and shit. He is. Professor Matt McManus, he's, he also has a podcast. I'm so sorry I forgot to mention your podcast. But oh, yeah. Oh, fuck. My, they're going to be so angry at me that I didn't mention this beginning. Plastic Pills. Uh, you can add us uh, at PodPill, and we do all kinds of cool critical theory stuff. And uh, Hot Takes on Politics, Zack Snyder's Justice League, uh, all kinds of neat stuff. Oh. Uh, originally, Matt was going to come on and join us for a nerd night where we talk about all things kind of pop culture before you go matt did you see that uh michael b jordan is trying to push to be the black obama superman in ta-nehisi coates's <laughs> dc superman did you see that he'll turn i did yeah i mean i liked him in black panther though i mean um the first movie i saw him in was uh what was it chronicle you know the one way back in the day was he a boy like a child? Yeah, he, he played a teenager in that movie, right? Oh, okay. He, he okay. had superhero. I, I think he's a good actor. I mean, if he's going to be Black Superman, then 
I'm down for it. I'll watch it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Obama Superman. On that note, everybody, if you are a patron, then you know the link is already up. We'll be there in a few minutes. If you're not a patron, become one. It's inexpensive. It's fun. You get to be part of the Mau Mau Hour. You get to see the Nerd Night shows where it's all of us and people like Matthew Film Guy, Conan Neutron, and God knows who else we get to bring in for all the, the nerdness. Uh, what else are we doing? What about the hats? And the, and, we and got the hats, motherfucker. <laughs> we got merch. We've got merchandise. Please go to we all do have merchandise. I'm going to share the screen so everyone can see. Hold on. Give me one second. Bam. And you can see we have some very nice. This is Revolution merchandise. I'm very excited about the hat I purchased today. Uh, I saw that it's on the way. And did you get your tracking number? Uh, I probably did. I haven't checked my email yet, so I will I, check that out. But I'm super yeah. excited about being able to wear my This Is Revolution hat on the show so I can be appropriately attired. Matt, I hope you enjoy coming on our show and be willing to come back again to uh, chat with us at another another time. Uh, hey, man, anytime. If you want to talk about nerd shit, that's like 90% of what I do with my spare time. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, anytime, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, i I don't know if you know uh, Dan Larson from Toy Galaxy. Yeah, yeah. He's also another friend of the show we're trying to get back on. So we're trying to have a big uh, nerd night. We also have movie night. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. And in honor of Matt liking all things nerdy, let's go out with some cartoons. Solidarity, guys. <laughs>